Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Our hostess for today's program is Teresa Miller, Executive Director for the Oklahoma Center for Poets and Writers at OSU Tulsa. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My very special guest today is Oscar winning actress Shirley Jones. Thanks for being here, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be. You've got one of the most beautiful voices. Thank you. Just extraordinary. I still love singing. Do a lot. you? Oh, yeah. I wondered about that because Barbara Streisand said recently that she doesn't like to sing. I know. I just, as a matter of fact, I just read an article this morning in the paper and uh, she said that. Uh, she is going to come back, but not do the elaborate concerts that she was mm -hmm. doing. And you know, one of the one of the big reasons that she gave it up. You know, she has terrible stage fright, mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. And she said that the article in the paper said she has, there's a pill for it now. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> Have That's you ever great. suffered from stage fright? Um, you know, everybody gets a little bit nervous. Everybody gets. I call it sort of anticipation and. Uh, but no, not stage fright. And a little good. And isn't a it? little, yeah, because that's the adrenaline coming out and coming up. And you know, then once I'm out on stage, you know, first five minutes, I'm fine. I think that having a voice like yours has got to be empowering. I've always, if I could sing like Shirley Jones, I could sing myself out of anything. <laughs> Is it empowering? It really, it's a gift. Just let me say that it's a gift. I was singing when I was four and five years old, so it was God given. And then I started formal study when I was 12, and uh, I've been singing ever since. Empowering? I don't know. Uh, it, it's something that just has to come out of me, and I feel better, you know, when I sing. Mm. And fortunately, people enjoy it, and so I feel like I'm giving. I'm giving back, you know, and that's a nice feeling. When you're in a group situation, family, friends, public situation, and everybody joins together to sing national anthem or the happy birthday yes. song, do heads suddenly start to turn they toward you? <laughs> Going to say. Yeah, in fact, I was at the uh, at, at a baseball game just recently in California, and uh, we were singing the national anthem as they do, as you know, sure. the opening of the game. And we're all standing up, and I was with my husband, and I'm singing out, and finally it was over, and I sat down, and the whole back row in back of me leaned over and said, "Wow, we never thought we'd be singing with Shirley Jones." <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got an ensemble. That was really cute. Well, I, uh, I had to ask also about about the breadth of your, your, your talent because I wonder, it, did you start as a singer and then become an actress or were the two together for you from the well, very beginning? Well, no, it was, it was basically singing. I mean, at, at that time and way on, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, they, they had th this idea that if you were a singer, in quotes, you were not an actress, so to speak, which of course is stupid right. because you can do both. And, uh, and thank heaven I proved that because I won an Academy Award for acting. You know, after they stopped making the American musical, that was sort of finished, and motion pictures were just realism and, and so forth. So the musical was finished. So I had to do something, and I had to prove myself as an actress because they didn't believe that if you were a singer, you could do both. Mm. But yes, you can. Uh, but singing came first, of course. Well, and figuratively speaking, you've had some interesting geographic leaps in your career. You went from South Pacific to Oklahoma. Tell us how that <laughs> happened. Well, it's quite a story. Um, I was on my way to college, I, just out of high school, and of course during my high school years, as I said, I was always singing. Uh, I started formal study when I was 12, and then I, of course, you know, would sing at the local functions. I lived in this very, very small town in Pennsylvania, 800 residents, mm -hmm. so it was tiny. Mm -hmm. And uh, But every week I'd go into Pittsburgh, and then I won the title of Miss Pittsburgh, the beauty contest. And I had a scholarship to the Pittsburgh Playhouse because of that. So during the summers, while I was still in high school, I would study at the Playhouse. And then I spent about a half a year afterwards still studying at the Playhouse. And I was the queen of the children's theater there, so to speak, and did all of the, you know, the fairy tale yeah. things. Sure. Uh, then I was on my way to college. And uh, this, I was just 18. And uh, this was during the summer. And my parents took me to New York on a summer holiday. And I knew a pianist in New York who, I had worked with at the Pittsburgh Playhouse, and so I called him, and he's, he said, come on up, we'll sing a few tunes, you know, so mm -hmm. I did, and he said, listen, they're having an open audition for Rogers and Hammerstein's casting director today, why don't you go down and see mm -hmm. what you can do? I said, well, I've never been to a professional audition, you know, I was on my way to school and so forth. He said, it'd be, it'd be fun, he said, you know, you just see what happens. Well, of course, it changed the whole course of my life. I went and I sang for the casting director, mm -hmm. and... Um, he in turn called in Richard Rogers himself to come and hear me. And Richard Rogers called Oscar Hammerstein at home and said, would you come? I want you to hear this girl. And I sang for the two of them. And they asked me, um, did I know the score of Oklahoma? And I said, well, I, I 
I know the the music. I don't know the words. And of course, I was talking to the lyricist, mm -hmm, Oscar. Mm -hmm. You know, so. And uh, they said, and my pianist at that point had to leave because they'd canceled the rest of the auditions for the day, and he had to catch an airplane. And so, so Oscar Hammerstein said, "Well, don't worry, we have a full orchestra across the street. It's the City <laughs> Center Symphony <laughs> oh, that Richard Rodgers had been conducting because it was going and out on another time." I'm a kid. Time. And very green. I mean, I was very naive. I'd never been to New York City. I'd never heard a symphony, let alone sing with one. They took me across the street, gave me the score of Oklahoma, and I stood with it in front of my face, shaking, of course. And I sang three songs with the City Center Symphony. And after that, Richard Rogers said, we have an opening for you in South Pacific, one of our shows that was running on Broadway. We'd like you to take over as one of the nurses, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, we have something else in mind, but we won't discuss it now. And, of course, that was the film of Oklahoma. Oh, wow. And that's how fast it happened. Wow. I was in the last six months of the Broadway production of South Pacific, went into another show called Me and Juliet, which was a less, one of their lesser shows, playing the role of Juliet, which mm -hmm. was a, a mm -hmm. featured part. And within the year, I was sent to California to screen test for the motion picture of Oklahoma. So from that first audition, it was just about a year and I was in Hollywood doing the lead in Oklahoma. Wow, just incredible. It was an incredible story. An Did incredible. you realize how incredible it was no, at the time? No, not at the time. I, you know, at first I thought, oh, wow, this is easy. I guess this happens to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, and did you have a sense you know, as you were making the film that this was a classic? Oh, sure. I knew that. You knew that. I had too. seen the stage production in Pittsburgh. It was one of the few mm -hmm. shows that I had, that had come to Pittsburgh, you know, the uh, uh, road show, and I saw Oklahoma, so I knew it. And uh, but it was hard work. I mean, I thought making movies was you know you you look beautiful. You're on a set, <laughs> they comb your hair, and you say your lines. Mm -hmm. Well, we were in Nogales, Arizona, was which, which is where it was filmed. Well, by the way, I'm sorry, it was not, not, Oklahoma, not Oklahoma, but it was Arizona. Oklahoma was too built up at that time. They had to have the turn of the century look, and that's we that, are very sophisticated. Yeah, that's where it was then because it was on the Mexican border, and so. Uh, they built the farmhouse and planted the corn and did everything. But we were there for eight months mm. and in the heat and in the rain. And this is before the unions came in and said actors do have a life. You know, you can't work them around the clock. Right. So we worked 15-hour days, seven days a week. It's incredible. It was incredible. It was hard, 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 hard work. Is it hard also when you've seen a role on stage, another actress playing Laurie Williams, and then you have to create that role in film and make it your own? Is, is that difficult at all? How do you put your personal stamp on it? Because we well, are the face of Lori today. Well, the thing is, and, and I guess, once again, th this was fortunate. I had done some stage work. You know, I said South Pacific and a little bit of me and Juliet and, of course, just the, you know, the, the little theater stuff in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. But when I screen tested for uh, the movie, uh, Fred Zinneman, you know, directed mm -hmm. the film, who's mm -hmm. a fine, fine director. I was very fortunate to get that kind of a director first right. time out. And uh, he said, uh, after I finished the test, he said, have you ever acted, acted before a camera before? And I said, no. And he said, well, you performed on the stage. I said, yes, but not very much. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you are a natural for the camera. Mm -hmm. He said, you, obviously what had happened is I had not developed the grand stage habits that actors who work on the stage do, so that I was contained enough and malleable for him to be able to direct me and he was sort of my Svengali then, you know, mm. in that film. What a training ground. Yes, I mean, with your That's first, what I'm saying, my first... First major film. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's still just stunning to me to imagine that. The musical Oklahoma is based on the play Green Grow the Lilacs right. by Oklahoma playwright Lynn Riggs and, of course, then Rodgers and Hammer. You were the only person ever under contract with Rodgers and Hammer. Five-year contract I had, and under the contract I did Oklahoma and Carousel and the stage production of Oklahoma after the film which had to be a neat experience. It was fabulous. I met my first husband, Jack Cassidy, who yeah. played Curly. And we were all over Europe. We did it in Europe, Paris and Rome, and uh, that was wonderful. Do you develop a special kinship or feel a special kinship with the, the writers and with the lyricists and the composers who put these projects together? Well, you know, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein were like, they were my mentors. Mm -hmm. They were like my second fathers, you know. They took care of me, you know, just magnificently. And, uh, uh, Again, you know, that was a very fortunate thing because they they were both so talented mm -hmm. and both so well respected. And to come into the business and have those two men, you know, sort of as as my, you know, mentors, it was just 
incredible. Mm. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned mentioned Carousel, and you co-starred with Gordon McRae. He was in Oklahoma, and then you co-starred right. with him again Carousel. in Carousel. Did that make it easier or harder? Did you see him in that same role as, as in Oklahoma, or was it? Well, you know, he wasn't supposed to do Carousel. Frank right. Sinatra was supposed oh, to do Carousel. Okay. And as a matter of fact, we had done all of the pre-production with Frank Sinatra. We did the costume fittings. We did the rehearsals. We, we, we even did the pre-recordings. You know, that, that's mm -hmm, when you mm -hmm. did the pre-recordings and didn't sing live on, on the screen. And so all of that was done. All the pre-production was done. And Frank was, was playing Billy Bigelow. And uh, they, they were shooting in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. And I was flown to Maine. And all of the singers and dancers had been rehearsing for months mm -hmm. up in Maine, mm -hmm. you know. And it was the first day of shooting that Frank and I were supposed to do our first scene. And I knew that we were going to be doing the film in two separate processes, Cinemascope, regular Cinemascope, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Cinemascope 55, mm -hmm. which would mean that we may have to shoot a couple of the scenes twice. But they had two cameras, but some of the scenes would have to be mm -hmm. shot twice. So Frank arrived on the set from the airport, brought him to the set, and we were all prepared to shoot. He got out of the car, and he saw the two cameras, and he said, what's this? And the director, Henry King was the director of Carousel, he said, well, Frank, you know, we're doing two separate processes. And he said, does that mean I have to do things twice? He said, some of the time. He said, I'm out of here. Back in the car, back to the airport, we had no leading man. Mm. And the producers, Phoebe and Henry Efren, married couple who were the producers of Carousel, were, he was in tears. He came over to me. He said, Shirley, where's Gordon McRae? I said, um, I think he's in Lake Tahoe doing a nightclub back mm -hmm. with his wife, mm -hmm. Sheila. He said, could you get him on the phone? And there was a, a pay phone right there. Mm -hmm. We were, we were mm -hmm. on, the, on the dock. And I said, uh, yeah, I think I have the number. Because so, we were friends, Gordon and I, after, after Oklahoma. I called him. I got him right there. Mm -hmm. And I said, Gordon, how would you like to play Billy Bigelow in Carousel? And he said, give me three days. I have to lose 10 pounds. I'll be there. <laughs> And that's how he got the part. When you star with someone like Gordon McRae, and then I'm thinking particularly right now of, of Robert Preston, who was this bigger-than-life oh, personality, yes. is that inspiring or overwhelming at times? You and Robert Preston seem to, to, to mesh so well in the music now. Well, he was, he was such a wonderful actor. You know, Bob Preston had done a lot of films before The Music Man. But he was sort of always classified as a you know a B actor in in motion mm -hmm. pictures, and yet his, his the, the bulk of his talent had not submerged yet, at least to the public, until the Music Man, and then after that he did some wonderful films, Victor Victoria. But the lovely thing about him is that he had just completed, I believe, three years. I think Music Man ran at least two or three years on Broadway, and he had done the the role, and he, you know he won the Tony, and he was a giant star on Broadway. And then to come out to do the film, I thought, oh, you know, um, it's going to be difficult mm -hmm. because he was so well established mm -hmm. in the role and he'd done it with Barbara Cook on the stage. And now to have a different Marion the librarian, you know, I thought he'll probably be saying, well, we didn't do it that way. This is the <laughs> way we should, you, you mm -hmm. know, which mm -hmm. would be normal, really. Mm -hmm. It was the most amazing thing. It was like he was doing it for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get over that. Everybody couldn't. Anna White was the choreographer, and uh, Morton DaCosta was the director, and, and they just thought it was so incredible that he, you know, he could change the, the, his course of direction as the character for the film, you know, if it had, if need be. Mm -hmm. And he never once said, you know, well, surely this was the way, you know, mm -hmm. it was just, he was such a wonderful actor. I mean, he could conform to whatever was happening for the moment. Do you rewatch these films oh, now that sure. they're out in DVD? What's it like seeing yourself on film after a number of years? I know when I look at myself in home videos, I think that seems so unreal. <laughs> What's it like from a professional perspective? Well, you know, for me, uh, at this point in my life, I, I look at the film and I, it's almost like I don't know that little girl up there. You know, I say, who's that little girl? She's not bad. <laughs> She's okay. You know, I enjoy the film. What I'm saying is I have a different perspective of the picture now. You know, I'm not watching me. I'm watching the thing as a whole and um, enjoying it like everybody else. You mentioned the role that was a departure for you after the musicals and Elmer Gantry. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and how it came about. Were there people saying, really, this isn't right for you, Shirley? I mean, playing a prostitute? Well, yeah, I got a lot of, you know, so-called hate mail, you know, from the churches. Seriously? And, oh, yeah. Yeah, how they dare had to you? overwhelm you because you've been everyone's darling. That's exactly right. I was America's princess, you know, Cinderella and all of that. 
and now I was changing the whole course of my character. But you know what the point is. I mean, it's, it's silly. I'm an actress. That's mm -hmm. what you do. You play roles. And uh, had I not done Elmer Gantry, I would not have had the longevity I've had in my career. Absolutely not. Because they stopped making musical films, which I told you earlier, and my career was over. It was over. I mean, I couldn't get a job. And I had been, you know, the, the, the star of major musicals. And, mm -hmm. But I couldn't get a job because, once again, the powers that be, the Hollywood producers and writers and everybody said, well, she's, she's a singer. You mm -hmm. know, we'll get an actress for that. So I went into television. And that, fortunately, was at the time when they were doing the wonderful live mm -hmm. dramas like Playhouse 90 and, and Philco Playhouse Matinee Theater. So I got a wonderful part in a show called The, the Big Slide with Red Skelton on mm -hmm. Playhouse 90. Mm -hmm. And it was during the 20s, during the Max Sennett days, and he played a comic on the skids. And I played a, a sunshine girl, one of the sunshine girls, and I was an alcoholic. So it gave me an opportunity to show some acting, you know. And Burt Lancaster saw that show. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that came to the fore. And uh, he and Richard Brooks were co-producers on Elmer Gantry. And he wanted me, he wanted Richard to meet me. He said, I think she's perfect for this. He said, I saw her do the Playhouse 90. She can act. And uh, the fact is, Lulu Baines, which was the name of the prostitute, mm -hmm. uh, had been a minister's daughter. So, you know, it was not the all bad street girl. It's a girl that went bad type thing for reasons. And so he said, I think she's perfect for it. And I was in San Francisco at the time doing a nightclub back with Jack Cassidy. He called me and he said, Shirley, I couldn't believe it was Burt Lancaster calling me and said, could you come in over the weekend? I want you to meet Richard Brooks, get the novel, Sinclair Lewis novel, Elmer Gantry. And he said, I want you to read it. And he said, it's the role of the prostitute. Well, I couldn't believe my ears. But at least I was even going to meet with Richard Brooks about this. I flew in, met with Brooks, and um, he gave me, he had a habit of not letting his actors read the entire script. He was always paranoid about people mm -hmm. stealing his material. So he, he gave me just my part, you know. He said, go in the other room, read it, tell me what you think. Well, I knew if I, I came back and I said, you know, uh, I'll do this for nothing. Uh, this is an incredible, incredible mm -hmm. writing incredible part and I really want to do it. Brooks wasn't convinced totally but um, Bert, Bert came to the fore again and he he wanted me so he said I they you know they they did sort of a compromise and I got the part which is great but the first day of shooting I had the hardest scene I had to do in the film which was the scene in the house of prostitution where I'm talking about Elmer Gantry mm -hmm. in a slip you know with the girls and he didn't give me one direction, Brooks. He just sat and smoked his pipe. You know, he was a tough guy. Tough You've guy. You've got to be wondering what he's Ex thinking. Ex-Marine. Oh, he was a tough guy. And great writer, great director, but known for being a really rough guy. So, and I knew that he wasn't happy with me anyway, initially. And so, did the scene, went home that night uh, crying to my husband and said, he's gonna, I'm finished, he's going to fire me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want me, he never did want me. He didn't speak to me, he didn't give me a direction, he didn't do anything. The next day I didn't have to work. And of course they, they see the rushes of each day's mm -hmm. shoot, you know. And he called me the next night and he said, Shirley, it's Richard Brooks. He said, I owe you an apology. He said, we just saw the work from yesterday. And he said, not only are you going to be brilliant in this, but I predict you're going to win an Academy Award. Then we were friends from then on. I did another film with him called The Happy Ending, mm -hmm. and um, he was a great director-writer. And you did get the Academy I Award. I did get the Academy Award. And then suddenly that spotlight on you is even brighter. Have, have you gotten used to all the public attention uh, from the media for you, for your children, Sean yeah. and Patrick and Ryan, your stepson? Did that get easier for you? Are you comfortable well, with that? Or that's are a hard part of the business for me. You know, I... I uh, uh, I love doing what I, I, I do, and I love, I'm love. i still doing it, concerts all over the country. And, of course, my kids were, both two of them are rock stars, David, my stepson, and Sean, you know, my sure. son. Uh, it's a tough business, and the toughest part is you're, you're constantly exposed to the media. And as we all know, today the media is worse than it's ever been. I mean, no matter wow. what, there's no privacy whatsoever. Um, so that, for me, has always been the hard part. But, on the other hand, I know that that's what has to be. That's all part of the business. And if we weren't exposed to 
our audiences and the magazines and the newspapers and so forth, we'd be out of the business. So I mean, it's you know, it's a major part of it. Well, and you were in our home every week with the Partridge That's family. That's right, for five years. Was that fun doing that series? Yeah, it was. It was fun for me personally, too, because I had, my kids were, you know, when I was doing movies, I was all over the world on location. So I would take the babies and take a nanny, you know, and do the whole number. But then they were in school, and I couldn't do that anymore. And I was very torn, very torn, because my children were very important to me, and I wanted to be there for all the holidays and everything. Well, that's when they offered me the, the series, mm -hmm. The Partridge Family, just about that time. And everybody, you know, managers and agents, and said, Shirley, don't do television. It'll kill your movie career, because I had been... Right. And that was that was then considered a step down. Now, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. it's a whole different story. But it was a step down to sort of go into television. But I read the script, and I thought, you know what? This is going to be a hit. It has music. It's different. She's a working mother, you mm -hmm. know. Well, that's right. Yeah, right. She's ahead of working, her time. Ahead of the time, exactly. With children, uh, it exposes all of those problems that surround that. And I said, also, it'll, I can stay home. It's a sitcom, it's a half hour show, it wouldn't be lots of hard work, lots of hours. I can be with my kids if it's a hit. And I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. Yes. And, and of course the rest is history. Yes, it exactly. was a huge yeah. hit and we were getting all kinds of calls. Uh, is Mrs. Partridge coming yes. <laughs> uh, to Tulsa? I wanted to ask you also about the book you wrote with your husband, yes. Marty Ingalls, Shirley and Marty, an unlikely love story. Did you learn a lot about yourself writing that book, oh, a lot about yeah. Marty oh, from writing that book? Of course. I mean, they called it a dual autobiography and of course, if you've read it, you know that we are as different as oil and water and night and day. I mean, it's it, it, we were very different people. You know, that thing of opposites attract definitely applies to us, I guess. Um, he was born in Brooklyn, you know, and he's Jewish, and, uh, you know, his, his, his whole heritage is very different than mine. I'm a small-town girl, you know, raised a Methodist, mm -hmm. the whole number. But he's... I love comics, and if you read the book, you know, what got me was his humor, mm -hmm. and uh, it still does. We're married 25 years, and, uh, you know, it, it told it, the book is sort of my life, his life, and then our life together. That's kind of how the book goes. Well, you know, you have this wonderful ongoing career. We hear all these sad stories about actresses who, who peak early in their career yeah. and then are not able to sustain that. You've sustained that. You've managed to have a happy family life as well. How have you been able to do all of that? Well, it's not easy. <laughs> I, it can't be. It can't it's be. It's not easy. Um, I have um, uh, a set of values that I live by and um, always have, and I think that's from my childhood, you know, from my upbringing. I had a very solid foundation. I have to thank my, my parents. I'm an only child. Uh, my grandmother lived next door. I was <laughs> raised in a small town. I had a lot of cousins, so I was not a spoiled brat, they say, although I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but, but um, you know, so I had wonderful family foundation as a, as, a, as a child. And that has sustained me through being in the business, through all of the rejections that one can get in show business, and they're really can be terrible ones. And they're personal ones. And that's exactly right. They're personal ones. So, but if you take them personally, you're finished. You're finished. How do you build yourself up a wall? My my feeling about the business, and I try to teach my kids the same thing because they're all in it, uh, is that not it's it should not be your way of life. It should be what you how you make a living. It's your job mm -hmm. and you do the best you can and be the most responsible when you do your job like anybody else would do their job. Right. But when you come home at night, leave it at the studio, leave it on the stage. Your home is your foundation, your children, your husband, your friends. That's where it is. It's got to be so. harder when your kids are out there yes. and they're getting the reviews and, and the comments oh, and sure. so forth. And, and a lot of wonderful praise. Oh, but yeah. then those futile barbs. And well, oh yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, it's tough. But again, I think, you know, I tried to give them the values that I had. And I think for the most part, I think I succeeded. They seem to understand the business for what it is. They don't get hurt personally by it. They get rejected when the job doesn't come in, you know. I mean, my son Patrick is a beautiful singer-actor that mm -hmm. toured 18 months singing the lead in Aida, Elton John's Aida, and he has two little boys, very happily married, 
But you know, uh, jobs are few and far between, and he's got two children to raise. And he said, Mother, I don't know. I'm going to go out and go into real estate. I mean, <laughs> you know, so, and then, of course, a job will happen. That's what happens. You know, I mean, that's what the business is about. But it's tough. Had the business changed a lot since you first started in those days in Oklahoma when you had that wonderful mentorship from Rogers and Hammerstein? Yes, it's we changed didn't... an awful lot. Well, you know, with with cable coming into television and, uh, you know, the the... the, the uh, there's just so much competition now. I mean, everybody wants to be an actor. And on the other side, you know, you do a television show. Uh, there used to be one director, one producer, one executive producer. Now you walk on the set and there you'll see about 10 to 15 guys and, and gals standing back there and they're all producers. Mm -hmm. And they all have to come to a decision. You know, it used to be one or two people. It's very difficult now because everybody's afraid of losing their job. Nobody wants to make a mistake. And the actor, unfortunately, is always the last man on the totem pole. He's always the one that, you know, says, has his hand out and said, wait a minute, you know, do I have a job mm -hmm. or don't I? Mm -hmm. And um, it's unfortunate, but and it's tough today. And you're still very busy today. You do acting roles, yes. concerts. When you go out and sing to people, there's a wonderful intimacy in that. What's that like? What are you finding out? What's the mood of our country these days? Well, I I think it's one. I, well, the, my audiences have been wonderful. Of course, you know, obviously where I where I go, they're the audiences that know me, and uh, you know, either the ones from the Partridge Family or from my movies, mm -hmm. and so I have great audiences when oh, I yeah, sing, yeah. and I do everything from just piano in me, which I love to do mm -hmm. in a smaller venue, maybe mm -hmm. three four hundred seats, to the full symphony, you know, and and the big bands as well. So, um, it's been great. I mean, I I have wonderful audiences, and they. They come to hear me do the things from Oklahoma and Carousel and The Music Man. They come to hear me talk about the Partridge family. They come to hear me talk about my life. And I do all of that in the concert. You know. Well, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on your thank wonderful you. career. Thank all of you for joining us on Writing Out Loud.